privacy notice pop up in the top of your screen, uh, just have a read of it or click dismiss. And uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Paddy O'Connor and firstly Owen Devine O'Grady, who's going to kick off tonight's proceedings with um, the title of tonight is Session Planning for the Youth and the Adult Coach. So Owen, I'll call you in there and I'll call up the presentation. Thanks everyone, I hope you enjoy. Thanks a million, Damien, and thanks to everyone for joining us again this evening. Um, so as Damien said, the title for this evening is Session Planning for Youth and Adult um, Players. So if we click on to our aims, we'll just go down through the couple of things that we're hoping to hit on tonight. So to look at the different components of a good se of a good session. So really, what are the things that we'd want to include in a good session and then how can we use them best? Um, games based coaching so why is it so important and how can we incorporate it as much as we can uh, some session plan templates so different ways we can uh, format a session and plan plan it out and then we have some templates that you could use going forward and then how to make the most of our session by review and afterwards so myself and paddy will show you what we go through to review so just to get things kicked off and that you can get used to using the chat feature for in case you have any questions later, I just want you to fill in what age group you're working with so we can get a feel with what's the majority of people and um, what sort of age grade they're working with. So if you can just click on the little chat box and just type in under 16, under 14 or whatever age grade it is you're working on. We'll just give you a little bit of time to do that. Try again. Good stuff, I see them rolling in there. That's great, so it's just to give us a feel about what age grades that uh, people are working at and where the majority is. Um, so we can move on there, Damien. Um, so I'm gonna hand you over now to Paddy O'Connor. He's gonna take you through the first part. Um, so Paddy, if you want to turn on the mic yeah. and the camera there. Cheers, Owen. Hear me okay? All good, Paddy. Okay. Yeah, all good, Delhi. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to play a couple of video clips and we're going to ask you as coaches, whatever age group you're working with, which of these activities are you more than, like, more than likely going to use? So there's, there's two sets of activities and pairs being, being going to be played now in a second. So you can just jot down yourself for your own sake. What activities would you more than likely use in a coaching session? So we'll just we'll clip on to them there now. So two activities there, just looking at hand passing as a, as a main skill. So again, just look at it, looking at it there, what activity will you be more than likely to use in your session? So we're going to go on to another one now, just in regard to kick passing. So you can just click on ahead, Damien. So um, the two activities there, I suppose, we're looking at hand passing and kick passing there. The first two for the hand passing, one was a, a kind of a, a star-shaped drill support play one. The second one was a, a possession game where they have to work the ball into grids and work the ball out and work on support play. So again, looking at them, what ones would you use? But also then the kick passing one, which was a, a, 
a, a square box kick pass and drill and the next one was just a possession game so a 3v3 possession game so think it to yourselves if I had a choice between either of those to develop kick passing what would I use and when would I use okay so what I'm going to nip on to now is just two little videos and we're going to look at uh, Niall Miner from DCU you all would know would have a, a huge experience on the coaching scene obviously involved with Dublin and DCU Professor Mina, and then you have Paul Kinnerock, which is who is the um, the Limerick senior hurling coach, but actually is the predominant sport would actually be Gaelic football. But he, he's a guy that has done a lot of work on games based coaching, and both of them done two really good presentations a couple of years ago at the coaching conference. And what I want you to see is just what are the key messages the lads t- you, that you take from these two videos talking about games based coaching and thinking about the couple of activities we just played beforehand on the hand pass and on the kick pass. And so, if you can have a listen to these, write down a couple of key points, and we'll go through them. to create a practice that allows players to learn implicitly. Don't realise it. Mickey Whelan loves this term about implicit learning. All of a sudden, you're learning and you don't realise it. You, know, you go out the next day, jeez, I did that, I didn't realise. I'm making better decisions. It's incurring implicitly, not explicitly. And that's the way you want them to learn. You have to manipulate the constraints or the conditions of practice to make sure they're appropriate, they're appropriate level, okay, and to ensure that you're going to have improvement in skills. It should be goal oriented. So each time you go out, is the purpose of the game, is it to retain possession? Is it about the transition? Are we going to really focus on transitioning from offense or transitioning to defense? Or is it going to be about where we're going to have the engagement line? You have to decide all of those things. But make sure there's a, there's a purpose and there's a goal orientation to just one of a random game. There has to be a purpose to the game. And what you should do is you should guide and shape rather than dictate the practice of the training. The more your voice is heard, the less coaching you're doing, the less learning they're undertaking. The less you hear yourself, the more learning is taking place. If that's one message you want to get from today, that's it. If you're shouting, they're not learning. If you have your mouth shut, they're learning. Believe you me, they're learning. And we should, you should also rely on skillful observation and player questioning. And we call this discovery learning. So basically, you do a warm-up, Dynamic, specific, you play a game, you take them back in, you question them, you challenge them about what has happened, you go back into a game, you further question and challenge them, you, you, make, you progress the game, maybe you make it a little bit more difficult, you repeat the above cycle, you do a warm down. And you can focus on technique only when it improves the game or the ability of the individual to play in the game. Then you go in and you work on a specific technique. But the game should be the focus of your intervention. Here you have, if you want, your two broad categories. You have your traditional and your games-based. So your traditional said uh, the uh, majority of use of uh, drills ahead of games, uh, while in the game space uh, you have more games than drills. Um, so traditionally you have a kind of linear process. So traditional, I suppose, you're, it's associated that skills can be uh, skills need to be learned before you play them in the game. So we practice high repetitions of drills uh, before we can go into a game and then we test them in the game. Well, in a games-based approach, it's a more flexible outlook. So that's, it, the belief is that skills can be learned through playing games. So that's your likes of your first touch, the likes of your hooks and blocks, yeah, your kick passing, that they can be developed through well design games. So um, the likes of your overload situations there, they're very good for the development of skills because yes, you're putting minimal pressure um, on the player on the ball. So for example, your four versus twos, your five versus ones, you name it. But what you're allowing to take place is you're, you're allowing some level of decision making to take place with it. Then, I suppose, in traditional, there's a focus on, as I say, there are opportunities for uh, high repetitions of skill practice, uh, and the game's base believes in uh, that's having high opportunities for decision-making. Our traditional is, and you, it's really the, the teacher and the, and, the, and the student, and while in the game's based approach, um, the coach acts as a more facilitator role and um, allows the onus back in the players. So that's basically how um, 
what an example of how a traditional session might be and what a games-based session might be. So, um, Professor Moina earlier had a similar slide here on the games-based approach here. And um, it's, it really follows, I suppose, that you introduce a game early to establish context. So, the whole session then is built around an area that you want to work on within that game. So it could Okay, so just some of the key points that the two lads would have talked about, and, and they're predominantly talking about games-based methods for coaching and, and for developing skills and tactics and all the components that you want to look at. But some of the ones is that, I suppose, players need to be learning stuff, but they don't have to know they're learning stuff. So it can, it can be in the games you're doing. So implicitly, as my mind has said, um, it, Paul Kinnerock looked at, I suppose, developing the games through skill or starting the skills through games so that the game can, can help you develop the skills all the time. So, But when we look at games versus drills, when should we use them? Well, it really depends where the player is at in regard to that skill. But we want to really look at around the games-based model. So when you look at drills here, drills are very focused, but they are limited in decision-making. So when we look back on the, the hand-passing exercise we done earlier on, the little uh, kind of star-shaped hand-passing, very focused on hand-passing left and right, really good, but not a lot of decisions to be made. And I suppose games help players solve problems. And that's what we want of players on our pitch. When we're playing games, when we're looking at matches, we want to say, what was the problem today at the match? We need to get a game, play a game that puts the player, players in them positions and let them solve the problems. So I suppose kind of playing words and Colin would have done it last week on the child one would have been rather than a games-based approach, that everything is based on a game. So can you think of a drill like the ones or an activity you would have seen that you use but can you base it more around the game? Base it around the game. Use the step model to change it and make it more realistic to a match. And you're that you're and you're going to develop your skills and you're going to develop your decision making and your tactical side of things. So that that's really really important there. But again, going back to the the two lads when they talked about their session plans, is that the game is the center of everything, and then we work around that. We try and develop our skills around that. We try and question the players. We let the, the players figure out things for themselves. That's really, really important. When we look through our templates later on, it's really important. And we're looking at our sessions that we can say to the players, well, what did you do here? Why did you do that? And let them, let them figure it out rather than us just telling them. So, But the big thing again is that it's based around the game, that they're getting lots of decisions and it's around the game we're playing, whether it's in the under-16 league, the under-14 league, minor league, senior league, doesn't make a difference. That's the game of football that they're playing, which is really, really important. Okay, so just coming back in there, what we're going to ask you now to do is just so we can have a little bit of context for later on the webinar, is to just answer little three questions into the box. So same as you did for what age grade you're working with, now we just like to know how long are your sessions usually, how many players would you usually have at a session, and then how many coaches would you usually have, including yourself. So if you can just fill that in nice and quick, it doesn't have to be an essay or anything, just, um, the time, how many players and how many coaches. And then I'll move on, but you can be filling that in as you're listening and Paddy will be able to use that later on. So we'll be moving on then into kind of the nitty gritty of planning a session. And I suppose the, the place to start in planning a session is to think about what is the content you're going to bring in. So really what we're going to use is kind of two checklists. And the first one here is um, really simple, brings it back to the basics that we're going to include. Just go back there, Damien, for a second, that we're going to include technical, tactical and physical. So we would really like to try and have those three things in our sessions all the time. And then I suppose wrapped around that all the time is the psychosocial uh, element of that. So even though that's a big word, it's the really simple things we do as coaches. It's being positive, encouraging players and trying to build their confidence. And that's kind of all the way through doing technical coaching, doing tactical coaching and doing physical coaching. So that should be an ongoing thing. But if we pick one uh, technical area, tactical area and physical area to work on in a session, we'll be starting off on a great foot. So we can move on then. So with technical coaching and the technical area, um, it's important to note that how we coach is very important. So we could set up the best drill in the world or the best game in the world and the players will run through the game or the, the drill, but 
how can I make sure that we're getting our technical coaching done? And that's by trying to spot as many faults as we can and get the, the information to the players. So that's a key thing. And the best way of doing that, and it's proven with myself and Paddy have used it, is using head, hands, feet. So if we're working on a technical skill and we can try and learn what should the head be doing, what should the hands be doing, and what should the feet be doing, then it's much easier to spot these little things during games and to fix them and then give the information back to the players. Technical coaching also doesn't happen just in simple drills or um, when we're really working on quick hands or something like that. It's also something that we can bring in during the games or even matches um, that we're doing a training. So we should always be trying to watch for the technical things that we can improve. Um, and then even some coaches are using videos so we could video players so that we can give them direct feedback look this is what you're doing really well but this is somewhere you need to work on and again linking it back to the head hands feet so we have um a video coming up next of just kind of showing the technical points of a punt pass and it really nails the head hands feet that we'd like to be doing as much as we can during sessions lifting the head too early is a common error when learning the punt kick this can lead to miskicking the ball and sending the ball in the wrong direction. To correct this error, encourage the player to continue to keep the head down, focusing on the point of impact until the follow through is complete. Dropping the ball from the opposite hand to the kicking foot is another common error when performing the punt kick. This can lead to the player kicking the ball with the inside of the foot and misdirecting the pass or shot. To correct this error, ensure the player drops the ball from the hand at the kicking side and extends the opposite arm away from the body to aid balance. Not keeping the toes pointed and not following through in the direction of the target is a common error when performing the punt kick. To correct this error, keep the toes pointed throughout the kick, following through in the direction of the target. Lifting the head. So you can see there how important it is that we look at the head, hands, feet, because usually there, so if something goes wrong with the head, hands or the feet in any skill, that's what makes the skill break down. So then when we go to tactical coaching, um, as Niall Moyner was saying in the video earlier, um, and he really made the point well of implicit learning, that the players themselves need to learn. So can we set up um, training to give them as many opportunities to learn themselves? And really with tactical coaching, it's making decisions. So if we can get them into a scenario where they have to make decisions then they're working on their tactical prowess and um, if we look back at the games that paddy would have shown and um, if we think of the two hand passing drills one one of the drills had um no decisions in it they were just hand passing over and back and they run to the cone they're supposed to where there's no decisions and then in the next game every player was making decisions all the time so one game is working solely on the tactical or technical, sorry, and then the other one is working on technical and tactical things at the same time. So we have a game here just for an example, just to show you a really simple layout of a tactical game. So it's called the four goals game. So you set up four goals and you can have it's a 3v3 there, or you could have more than that in it. So it's a really simple game, but by having the four goals and kind of two goals for each team, it really brings in more decision making. So rather than defending one area, now there's two areas to defend and two areas to attack. So players can really use the space well and um, they have to be thinking all the time about how they're marking and creating space. Um, if we look at the step model, then just to change this game a little bit, we can make the area bigger or smaller. We could have more players um, in it or less players to make it a little bit more intense. Or for tactical reasons, we could add in an overload. So we could have a 4v3 or a 5v3. And that would challenge the defenders and the attackers a little bit more tactically. Um, and then also we can change what they're doing. So in this one, if you imagine they're hand passing, we can change that and make it much bigger into a kick passing game 
or we could have different challenges that they have to try and get so many passes before they get a goal. And these types of things will challenge their tactical prowess as well as their technical skills all the time. And um, so then the next part we'd be looking at would be the physical. And there's lots of different things out there that we can do for physical coaching. But I suppose the easiest way to make sure that we're planning it in sessions consistently, consistently is using the GA15. So some of you might be familiar with it, some of you might never have heard it before, but we have resources that Jamie will talk about at the end, so you'll be able to find out more if if need if you need to. Um, but basically, it's a really well put together warm up that will develop their functional competency and their body weight strength. So anyone over the age of 14 can do this and it's kind of starting at a basic level that they can progress on from there. But they need to get um, these exercises and movements really right first to build the basic strength and the body weight strength and then they can move on. It takes usually about 10 to 15 minutes and as the players get better at it, they'll kind of almost learn it off by heart and they'll, they'll be able to do it that bit quicker. And then there might be 100 to 150 repetitions of different exercises. So the different exercises could be the squat, push-up, um, lunge, different things that we've probably come across before, but it just kind of sets it up and gives a bit of a plan and a structure to it. And then if you look over one session, it probably won't make much difference at all, but 150 repetitions in a week, in four weeks, that's 400 to 600. In six months, that turns into 4,000 to 6,000. So if we were to do 100 to 150 reps, probably not much of a difference would be made, but four to 6,000 reps in a season would be a huge difference to a player and it would really help them develop and build the different things for functional competency and performance and that's their physical side in a season really really well managed so if we move on then just breaking it down a little bit more it's in different sections and again we'll include this in the resources that you can kind of read up on it if it's something you're looking at so um, we have kind of a running part, so that's just getting active, getting moving. Um, I'd always have the ball involved in this sort of an area. Um, then we have some stretching, there's balance, there's jumping, or sorry, strengthening, balance, jumping, um, some work on the hamstrings, and then sports specific stuff. So it could be sprints in different directions, or you could bring the football into it. One of the kind of negative things that the GA15 has got in the last couple of years is that it's um, very much the same thing over and over again, but it can be changed and manipulated and um, used differently by different coaches. It doesn't always have to be the regimental thing the same every time. Coaches can bring in a new thing all the time. In the beginning, I always change what's done in part A. It could be some sort of a simple hand passing game or something to bring a bit of laughter into it. And then we go through the usual exercises and the players I've worked with kind of react well to that. There's something new, but then they kind of get used to doing the same thing and they like the bit of routine. And um, then in red, we have strengthening and hamstrings. Those things could be taken out and you can use the rest of it as you usually do for your match days, but just taken out the strengthening and hamstrings. And that has worked well for me in players um, react well to knowing what's coming on match day. But you're making sure by taking out the red parts that it's not going to be impacted on the game, that it's a good warm up, but it's not going to be too much for them. So we have a video then just to show you an example of the GA15 um, that Damon will click into next. Okay, warm up starts boys, let's go. Forwards, backwards, side to side. Use all the space available. And calling, calling for the ball, well done. That's it, bring it down a level, not too fast, too soon. And we're jogging, groin step over, out to in, as we're jogging, ball is in hand. That's it, find a spot. Good boys, supporting leg, control, hip over knee, over ankle. Now change, in to out, in to out, as you're moving. Get a jog in between, so we keep warm. High knees, let's work the arms in our sprint action, let's go. Good, good. Good torso action. Tighten the core, head up. We're going into heel six. Let's work the arms in a sprint action again. That's good. Good. Let's walk into our hamstring stretch. Into the next one. 
Weight is on the back leg. Extend the front knee. Good. Toe pointed. And just roll forward out of the stretch. Breathing all the time. Remember the rules. No circles. Good. And we're walking. Well done. Well done. As you're walking, you're breathing. Moving into our single leg bridge. Knee, hip, shoulder. That's our alignment. If you feel the pelvis is dropping, self-correct or relax and do it again correctly. We're going into a single leg bridge drop. We're dropping our hips towards the floor, not quite touching it. An inch above and then squeezing the glute back up into our neutral position. Walking forward. Reverse with shoulders. Remember the key rule. The knee does not cross the toes, boys. Focus on your hip dropping rather than your knee bending. Squat by 10. Let's do it. Let's adopt the plank position, please. Remember our alignment. Shoulder, hip, knee. Ankle, four points, and also the alignment of elbow directly underneath the shoulder. We're into our side plank. Technique is crucial here. Hands on hips, explode for 10. Let's do it. Technique again. Technique is everything. Let's find a partner. We'll go straight into our single leg or the L. Remember to keep that back nice and straight. You're hinging from the hips. Let's bring it straight into our Nordic curves, boys. Nordic curves. Partner A on the ground. Remember, you go as far as you feel comfortable. As far as you feel comfortable in the held position, release to the floor, push yourself back up again. Okay, let's do it. Let's get a bit of movement back into the warm up again. Where we are. We're not feeding the ball, no, no. Just the exercise. Drive up in the air. Drive up in the air. Transfer that to football. High speed for the man coming on. One, two, and up. High speed. That's it. Higher again. Higher, not long. That's the one. Spread it out. Make it bigger. Make it bigger. Spread it out. Good job. Good job. And we're talking out again. When you receive, change direction. When you receive, change direction. Go somewhere else. Good. Good. That's excellent. Well done. Use the space. That's well done. Right hand. So um, just to kind of go back on that with the physical stuff, as the players get more used to it, they'll get a lot better um, at the exercises. And if we include those three things all the time, that's a really good start to a session. So then just the other thing I would use then for planning sessions is the Taurus principles. So are we testing and challenging players as best we can? Um, are we going to plan that players are the centre of the learning, are the centre of the game, and that we're individualising the games to them, so challenge them at their level? Are we making the games resemble the matches and the games as best we can? Are all the players going to be involved all of the time and lots of touches? And then are we going to make it as enjoyable and as engaging as possible? So you'll see later we have a session planner where we'll have kind of these questions to ask ourselves, including them. And then there's loads of different things that go into it. But by using these kind of two checklists, we, we should have a good start and a good um, way of bringing it as much things in as we can and the best things that we can use into it. So moving on then. Myself and Paddy are going to just uh, kind of do a scenario. So kind of what would usually happen, I suppose, in the dressing room after a match. 
So, Paddy, what did you make of that match today? Yeah, good on. I think we played well. Um, our tackling was really good. Like they only got a, they got a goal, but it was only um, we only really one chance at it. So, I think we tackled really well. But our kick pass is very surprised with our kick passing really poor. Like we've done a lot of work on kick passing in that square running drill. Like it, they've done that square running exercise for the last three or four weeks. Kick pass has been really good, really sharp. And then we get into the game. I, I just don't know what's happening to be honest. Yeah, I suppose I'd agree with that. Um, probably, I suppose the first thing that's really important to think is they're actually trying what we want them to try. Like they're they're making the right decisions in the kick passing that they're trying, but it's just not really coming off. I suppose the quality of the passes in there and probably the runs just aren't the right runs at the minute. Um, probably what's wrong is a training in that drill that we're talking about. There's probably no opposition that it's a bit too straightforward. They just have to kick it in their own time to a standing man and maybe if we could change that like it's it seems to be the opposition that's really breaking it down so much what should we do then for the next session like what what are we going to how could we change that trailer what could we do uh we i'd say we definitely need to get the lads kick passing under pressure and have them moving all the time so it's one thing to kick the ball when they're standing still but to be able to kick the ball when they're moving at pace and someone's closing them down is crucial um, and then I suppose there's two parts to the pass. So there's the, the kicker and then there's the guy running off the ball. So to get them to link better and to be thinking all the time about what's the right run I can make for the kick pass. Um, and then it's really the kick passing into the inside forwards is really what we need to work on. Yeah, I have actually a good game there. You can use it for kick passing. So it's called support the player. So basically you're kicking the ball into a zone and someone's coming off the player's shoulder in a match like so. You have a kind of a forward inside. That, that could work actually for John inside. So we could place him inside in the zone. He wins the ball. He lays it off. So he's kind of a wall player to lay the ball off to a player coming. And there won't be as much pressure on him as well. And it'll give more focus to the lads getting the ball into him maybe. So we might try that the next day then. Okay, ideal. That sounds good. Um, would there be anything else you would have noticed in the match? Yeah, probably John and Martin inside. Like They're not winning ball. They are probably good enough ball winners. But a little bit slow off the mark, I'd say. Like I think... Uh, I don't know, are they flat-footed or what is it, but they're very slow off the mark inside, so I don't know how we'd improve that. Yeah, and I suppose it's probably something for the whole team that we can improve. Um, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll put something together and I'll try and have it ready and we can put it into the warm-up the next day. I actually saw a good video on it recently, so I'll, um, I'll have a look at that and I'll send it on to you and we'll work it into our training next Tuesday. Yeah, sure, right. Okay, I'll send you on that game then. We'll put that into it. You do the speed stuff and the warm up there, and um, we'll try and develop another couple of maybe games around kicking under pressure, and develop it from there. I, I'll take out that kicking, passing, square drill, and we'll we, we'll change them with the games. Now we could be in trouble next week because your man is down to ref for a game that Damien Sheridan. He's a fucking disaster of a ref, so I don't know what we're going to do there. Oh look, Paddy, all you can do is control the controllables. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so just from the scenario there, we're just trying to, that's basically walking in off the pitch of the match and to have a conversation with your other coach rather than leaving it to the next day or the following session, what are we going to do? So really important to, to chat in the dressing room afterwards and just review what went on and have a couple of feeders of where you want to go the next day with your session, how you're going to improve the team. So what we took out of that was kick passing under pressure with the first touch, support play and getting away from the marker and stand and start speed so or just just speed speed work so they're the things that we're going to plan so what we're going to do now i'm going to throw up a session for you that we're going to plan i'm going to go through the whole session with videos and exercises and games that you can see how we planned our session and some activities you can bring back to your team so you can dip on there Damon. so you see here just on the session planner we have the three areas again the technical the tactical the physical so we we pick them in the dressing room after the three few areas that we want to improve are really important to get these in and then we just have them on top of our session plan that we know what we're working on. And then we have our little areas, our warm up, our activity one, activity two, activity three. And on the side, then just them terse questions and how can you, am I doing a good session? So it's things like how can it be made more enjoyable or engaging for the players? Um, will people be involved? Will we get lots of touches? So when you're filling your session out, you can see there that you can use them as a reference point. So again, the session starts off with a warm up, wall pass game. We'll go through that 4v2 kick passing progress back to the wall pass and support the target game and finish off with some shooting activity, something enjoyable. So we're going to go through that now in some videos that you can work on. So the first one is the uh, the warm-up. So Owen said, you can integrate the warm-up with loads of different activities. So what we've done here, we, we're going to use the J15 exercises 
and we're going to introduce these two ball handling exercises and finish off with some speed work and a warm up. So think of the exercise that went through in the video there with Keelan and Neil, and then you can include these exercises here. So just in pairs, using left and right, getting loads of touch to the ball, and being able to pass the ball left and right at pace, working their coordination and hand passing. So players love these. It's a big challenge to them as well, trying to push themselves on as fast as possible. Really, really important. Again, mix that in between your exercises, which is very, very important, your lunges and your stretches and things. Next is onto our speed. Yeah, just keep going. So just in pairs, doing a bit of speed work. Tagging each other. Bouncing one hop, drive onto the ball, that, that kind of speed off the mark. So again, just reaction, reaction all the time, speed at the end of the warm. Lovely time to put it in. Loads of different little exercises here that you can do with them. Gets that's the match running they're going to do after their 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 J15 exercises, your lunges, your stretches, your 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 core work and things like that. So really, really important there that you can do loads of little exercises here. Loads of variations there. The players can work, you can work with them. Sprinting five, ten meters, getting that ball, driving out. Double hop, driving into that ball, really important. So two little balls, two ball drops. So again, we love the links of all these videos up here. There's a link from Colin Malley. We like to use a lot of his videos and these exercises, some great resources. Hurry. Okay, so we've went through the warm up. The next thing we're going to work on is a wall pass game. So again, working on their kick passing in a game based scenario rather than the drill that we were doing, we've changed it now to a game. So we're going to start with a game, set the scenario by starting the game. So we'll click into that now. This game is based like this, called the wall pass game. So see the cones, the large grid, again, you can adapt the sizes to suit your, um, your, your needs. So at them cones, you have what's called a static man. And that's a wall. So what happens when you kick the ball off a wall? It's back to you, right? So that's the name of the game. So if you pass the ball to the wall, your team keeps the possession. So it's a skill refinement game. And what I'm looking for here, again, is your touch from your hand. But again, if you keep them down a small side of the game, you don't develop your kick back. So again, you have to come up with some skill kick passing. So this is my favorite. And again, it's the wall pass games, but there's a kick straight away, okay? Excuse the language here. Pardon? Yeah. yeah. So when you're in possession, you've always got an extra four place. That means you've always got an extra option. Now I've suspended the touch in this because I want the head lifted. So I want them to see the pass and I want them to execute the pass. Is that okay? Right, so that's fine and it's for skill refinement. Perfect opportunity for coaching, perfect opportunity to develop bilateral skills. Okay, because all you need to do is put the condition on, keep your left, use your left hand. Okay, so you can see it's quite good, isn't it? A lot of movement. Okay, now, bear in mind, skill refinement. And again, we said a lot of technical, tactical, whatever. So we're not really getting much out of this, only developing the skills. Would you agree? Okay, so, so I want to move that on a little. Okay, so that game there, as he said, working on skill refinement, really important. Working on their kick pass under pressure, as we talked about. So that game will be played for like, say, three two-minute games. But you'll have six v six inside and six on the outside. So two teams are working, one team is resting, and they're acting as the feeders on the outside. And the important thing there is that they're under a bit of pressure making their shots. But if, even if the kick passes aren't working, change it maybe to um, six v or four v two in the middle or something like that. That. They're getting a chance to kick pass. So we push on then the next time. We played a full game, as we said, and pushing on to the next game then. Basic 3v3 kicking, trying to really work on their technique. Kicking and moving all the time. So that exercise there, the 3v3 kicking, we went from a full game and then we've changed it in then to a, a small sided game. A small sided game. The players can refine their skills, but have more chances. So that could be set up using the full pitch. You could have um, a 4v2 in three spots of the pitch. We're saying the average group of players there that came up on the list there with coaches put down between 14 and 20 players. So if you have say, uh, 18 players there, three groups of six, 4v2 from the end line, say, to the 45, from the, between the two 45s, that's another pitch, between the 45 and the end line. So you can play that 4v2 game. So again, it's all game-based. 
we're working on the technical, the tactical stuff that we talked about on. We've clicked into the physical side of things as well. Then we go back into the wall side of the game. How do we progress that wall side of the game then? The wall pass game. So we'll go back into that game again, see can we progress it. Okay, so you watch now. You'll hear the coach call, you'll hear the whistle. Right, so it's changed to come from the river. Look at the runs. See the separation. That's what I'm looking for in that game. I'm looking can this can the um, the passer execute the pass properly. Okay? Right now, there's loads in that. So if I'm trying to get away from my man, the defender has to close that separation. See it changed again? So you're responsible for your man, okay? So when you're on the ball, you're looking for space. When you're off the ball, you're looking to close that space. See it change? Okay. Very intense. Only play it for a few minutes. One more. Yes, coach is referencing the corner. So it's changed again. Look at the look at the hard runs. Yeah, look at the close hand. Yeah, yeah. Still, the principles of the wall pass are skill refinement, except the ball can come from any of them points, either team. So the game changes, it ebbs and flows, one minute you're attacking, one minute you're defending. Right, really intense. Okay, and again, by using words like separation, you're not putting a clear picture in the player's head off the ball. Okay, is that okay? So I think language is vital. And sometimes, um, you know, you don't have to go through long winded, you know, explanations, just one or two words puts the picture in the player. Okay, so we progressed on the wall pass game there, which is really important. If you look up there in the tackle, support runs and getting away from your marker. So that game there definitely works on that. Works on that, that getting away from your marker, getting that separation as we talked about. So all we changed in that game was the ball can be thrown at any time from any other place in the end. The players have to react. Again, it's bringing a more tactical element into it. And then we finish off then with another game, a more full field game that we have called support to target. So we'll just click on there. So just we have an explanation for the game here. Basically, all you do is in any game, this can be 6v6, 5v5, 7v7, we create a zone in front of the goal. And we put it forward in there, like we talked about our full forward, winning the ball a little bit slow. So we keep it unmarked. And to get a score, the ball must go in to the forward and he can lay it off to a player coming. So again, we're going to work on our kick pass into our forward line, work on our support by the ball being popped off. Then to make it more difficult, then you can put a marker on it. But maybe you might have a 2v1 in there. You might have maybe two attackers in there. So two options for the long kick pass. One defender trying to cover them. So we're looking at that long kick pass. And again, we're looking at support play coming off. We're looking at off the, off the mark running really sharp, winning that ball and laid it off. But again, you don't have to just put the walls in front of the goal. You could have a wall in the middle of the pitch and act as support play if you want. So again, kicking the ball to the man in the middle of the pitch, he lays it off to another guy running down the field. But again, using your walls and runners are really important to develop support play. And also that helps develop the kick pass. So it's a great game. And the way we play that then is we play them in seven minute spurts. So then games would be three by seven minutes. Play for seven minutes, relax, come back in, talk to the players, question them, maybe change the condition if you have to. If you don't have to, that's fine. You keep playing and then go back into the game again. All game-based, all looking at trying to get the players to refine their skills and their tactical element and their physical element through games all the time. And then just for the finish of the session then, we just do a fun activity then. Just see at the bottom of the page here, you all know this, people start either side of the goal with a ball, one team on the right, one team on the left, they all have football. Um, they try and they, they shoot for two minutes, first team to 20 scores. Just a bit of competition. Team that loses the game has to pick up all the cones at the end of the day. So finish off with a bit of fun activity, but the fun activity has to have some sort of resemblance to the game. So we're working on on the loop shooting there, just soloing around the D, popping the ball over the bar. Coaches call out the numbers, losing team collects all the cones. So just finish off something nice and uh, a bit of crack with the players, but, but really focusing on skill as well is important. Okay, on to the next one. So we're going to go through the templates then. So we two templates for you here today. Game and fix it. Start off with a game. Have your warm-up. Start off with a game. Then play your game. Then go into your skill exercise. So that might be, we have drilled down here, but that could be an activity, a 4v2 kick pass activity. Did. So you start off with your wall game. You go into your 4v2 and you come back out. You go back into your wall game again and then support the player game. So again, it's all based around the game, but you have that little fix-it area that you can fix the skills. Now fix the skills in an area 
at the side of the pitch or on the pitch you're already using. But the idea being that it's more game based, it's based around the game. 4v2 is better than maybe playing that box drill as we showed at the start. So it's a game based centered approach we're looking at here. The next template then we have here is a three team template. Start off your session, pick three teams red and yellow play the wall game or to support the player game. Then up in a skill area on the other side of the pitch, use another coach. They work on their kick passing. They might start off with partner kick passing. Then they'll change to maybe um, running and kicking. Then they might change to maybe a 4v2 area and play the 4v2 kick passing game while the, all the other players in the game area play in a match. And then rotate the players every couple of minutes and every maybe seven minutes that each team gets a chance to go into the skill area, improve the skill with the coach and get back into the game. Again, it's all game centered. This is a great little template to use when you have two coaches, you just need someone to ref the game. You can do all the coaching in the skill area and get them back into a game and you can spend a lot of time with your players, which is really, really important. So one on and working on the spot and fix with the players. So that's a really good model that works really well when you have maybe you as a coach and maybe one other player to help you out. We haven't touched on the integration of physical fitness, but that's really important. And Owen just mentioned earlier on using your warm up to extend the physical fitness. So extend your warm up for five or ten minutes at the end. You can run a little circuit, do your warm up, do some ball drills that we've done around the two balls, then do a little circuit at the end of it. Let them do their push ups, their squats, their lunges, their RDLs, all these exercises, and you can really get a good fitness hit out of that. Otherwise, when we look at the other two templates, breaks and matches, during breaks and matches, don't just use them for carrying water and talking to the players. Maybe do some of the exercises, do some plank work, do some squats, do some lunges, do some jumping and landing exercises, and then get back into the game. But use every minute you have wisely and try and integrate all the elements, the technical, the tactical, and the physical. And that's a good way of, it, of including the physical fitness part into your sessions. Breaking games, bring them in, show them exercise, do the exercise, go back into a game. So you might do push up, one break, you might do squat the second break, and you might do lunge the third break. And then you've done three different exercises and you've added the physical element into your sessions. What option do I choose in the templates you looked at? So the three team and the skill and fix area. Well, you have to look at, I suppose, what area of, of a pitch do I have? How many players do I have? What type of equipment do I have? And how many coaches do I have? Again, it's up to you there, but you have two options now. And there's many other options out there. We love in the resource as well, like a circuit-based model. If you have three or four coaches that you can use a circuit based model but again it all comes down to you to ask yourself these questions before you start the session what area i have how many players will i have what type of equipment i have i and what coaches do i have finally i suppose the use of coaches is really important so um you might be stuck there with two coaches one of you might be very confident in coaching the other might be so always get them to referee the best time you will do your coaching when you step back when you step back from a session and watch, rather than being stuck in the middle of the game, get them to referee the game. And you can look at the game then and see things you want to improve on. Another nice way of doing it is get a parent to do the roll call. Really simple job. Don't do any coaching. But the most important thing they can do then, if they have a little box beside each player, a blank box, and as the training session is going along, you might see Owen Devine O'Grady attacking the ball. Tell them to write that in the box beside it. After the session, when you're reviewing your session, that coach or that parent has wrote that into it. They've taken a note on it. You know for this next session, you're going to work on own divine own divine abilities attacking the ball. So use parents wisely. You can use them again in them games as extra men, as feeders for the footballs, walls, giving the balls back. Really, really important. Another way of doing it is a lot of us get, I suppose, senior players from the club to come in and do a session. Some of them mightn't be very confident in doing sessions. Ask them to do one exercise they know of, or even just ask them to referee the game. Again, they're reffing the game. You're getting a huge opportunity to look at your team, pick out things, write down notes on different players. Damien Sheridan needs to work on this. Michael Kenny needs to work on this. John needs to work on this, whatever it is. And you can write it down then. And then you can review that at the end of your session. That's really important. So use your coaches wisely. Use your parents wisely if all possible. Use them as all these loads of different areas you can use them in. But don't just have them standing there with water bottles. Get them involved. Give them jobs because you want to make a better opportunity out of the time you have coaching your players. Okay, so then myself coming back in then just looking at this graphic. So review, plan, do. So planning is crucial that we review so that we can plan going forward. So as Paddy and myself did there, we reviewed after the match, then we planned and now we've done a session. And it, it comes back full circle that now we need to review that session and then we go and we plan again. So for reviewing our session, um, we use something like this, so the Taurus Coaching Principles Sheet. So again, this will be in the resources and it asks good questions that you could ask yourself after a session that 
did I hit the, all these targets and how could I improve for the next session? So we've just filled out two, for example. So look at that, was it testing and challenging? One of the big things that we wanted to do was encourage the players all the time to try these kick passes and see if they can do them. We weren't too worried if, if the kick pass didn't work, then we talked to the player about that it was the good idea or maybe it wasn't the right idea or what they did really well about their execution or what they can improve for the next time. Probably one of the negative things for ourselves was we didn't have any target in the wall pass game. There was no score to try and get to. They were just playing the game kind of for the sake of it almost. They were working. It was really good for working on the things, but the players at the end of the day want a kind of a target and something to try and aim for. Then if we look at putting the player at the centre, so we used questions to give the, the ownership back to the players on themselves learning, and it kind of creates more for them to think about what they're doing in the games. And then um, we probably could have done better at having the stronger players challenged more. So whether it's double marking or whether it's um, kind of rewarding them for using their weaker foot, we could have uh, made it a bit harder for them so that they didn't have to just kind of uh, glide by through the through the activity. So then Paddy's going to go through some ways of questioning the players. Yeah, so throughout the, the, the presentation so far, we've mentioned questions and questioning is so important. And so the heading I have here is suppose more questioning, less telling. A phrase that I always would hear is that if you tell someone something, a player something, you're robbing them of the learning. And that's really important. They won't get that chance to learn that again because you've told them. So try and question them and tease it out and coax it out of them that they can discover it themselves, which is really, it's far, it's far more beneficial for them. So just an example here, I'll just go through it. We always hear it on the pitch, stop fouling, use your near hand, use your near hand. Well, maybe asking the question, how should you tackle? What happens when I use this hand? Well, is it better to use the other hand? And give them little scenarios, or when should I tackle? When should I get my hand in? Is it when I'm far, when I'm, when I'm in touch and distance of the player, or when I'm shoulder to shoulder with the player? Get the questions, ask the players questions and let them tease it out. Really, really important. Again, stop kicking the ball to their extra man. Another question you can ask there, who is the best person to pass to and why? Who is the best person? So we kick the ball away. Well, who is the best person? Why did they kick there? How can you make more options for the kicker? Maybe the people inside, there's a sweeper in front. Ask the forwards inside, how can we make more options? Rather than telling them what runs to make, ask them how can they make more options for the kicker? Snip on again, Damien. Another couple of examples of questions. Technical side of things we're looking at here would be what hand do you hold the ball with when kicking with your right foot? So ask them, like if they're not confident on the weak side, ask them what hand should we hold the ball and let them figure that out. When they're maybe kicking a wide, where did your chest finish up? So if a guy keeps kicking the ball wide in the shooting exercise, ask him just to stop. Where did your chest finish when you start kicking the ball? Because every time you finish kicking the ball, where your chest goes is where the ball is going to go. Again, another little question, how can you help your partner on the ball? The guy keeps getting turned over. Well, the guy in the full forward gets to keep turning over. Maybe it's because he has no support. So you ask the other players, how can you help your partner? They need to make support and run. So let them decide that and, explain, and describe it out. Just the next one then. The best way, I suppose, to look at questions is this kind of anagram here, TED questions. So just three little phrases. Use these when asking your questions. Tell me. Tell me why you kicked the ball inside. Tell me how you done this. Tell me how you got the block in. Explain to me why you done this. Explain to me how. Describe to me how you done this. Really, really good way of asking questions because the players have to give you something back then. It's an open-ended question. Another good example then what you could do for your question is that you know you're working on the kick pass, you know you're working on support play, and maybe you say width you're working on. Well, write a couple of questions out in your session planner and bring them with you because it takes a while to get used to. But if you have pre-planned questions going into the session, rather than telling the players something, they learn way more than you asking them by you asking them questions and them come with an answer and them showing you and figuring it out for themselves. So you can plan your little questions before you go in, maybe three questions on the session and ask them questions as you're going through. So then um, we've kind of done in planning session to session, but we also want to be planning kind of a block of weeks or a certain amount of sessions. So I've done this with a couple of coaches and it's worked really, really well and given kind of clarity in where we're trying to go. So if we were to sit down as a group of coaches and say we have an age grade of under 16 there and we pick three priority skills that we work, want to work on, technical skills, three tactical things that we want to teach them, and then maybe three other things. And they don't have to be physical, they can be three kind of other things altogether. And if we kind of focus on that then for the season that 
there was a consistent message coming through and that we were working on these all the time and then there'll be space to add in other things so damon if you move on then we just add those things then into a kind of a grid like this so that's seven different sessions there which could be seven weeks or it might be three weeks depending on your situation but literally all we've done is use those skills and we've added them in in different places so we're keeping them um, the sessions different that it's not always the same thing over and over again that there's there's new skills coming into it and we're kind of chopping and changing but then we've also a consistent thing throughout that these are the three skills that we're going to target for the year that our players are going to be better at these three skills when they go on next year to maybe other coaches or with ourselves next year. Then in the yellow boxes as well, we have areas where you can, you know, bring something in that you might see along the way that you realize this group is falling behind on something, some particular skill or some particular area of the game. And that's where you bring them in, like myself and Paddy did reviewing something and adding it in into the little windows. So definitely a good way of planning and really important to plan over kind of, kind of, a certain amount of time ahead and then after them amount of sessions you could meet up again and see what worked what didn't work and move on again for the next six weeks just so on there just on the the planning side of things i divide at this moment i'm in trouble but when you look at your planning even if you have to postpone your session a week late or you have to maybe take a break in the week or do something you sit down with your coach and plan out where you're going and know if you can know oh, we're working on this for the year and we will react from stuff from the matches. Normally what happens is we go, we plan our sessions, we play our matches and the plan is thrown out the window. Well, look at the things you really want to plan. Then you're going to take things from matches, but you've got to take that time to plan and review. It's so important. You'll see huge benefit to your sessions and your players. And what will happen is you'll be far more confident going to your sessions and the players will get way more out of the sessions. So the, I can't emphasize the plan enough. It's really, really important. So then we're just going to set you kind of a challenge, something for you to think about yourselves. So think about how many minutes you have in a session, whether it be 60, 70 or 80 minutes, maybe. And then just kind of jot down out of these six headings, how much time you would spend at each thing. So you don't have to put it into the group chat up here or anything like that. Just have a think about it for yourselves um, and maybe jot it down on a piece of paper after kind of hearing what me and Paddy have to say. And maybe it's different to what you usually do maybe it's um you've kind of reevaluating what you were thinking and then set out what you'd ideally like to do and maybe going forward then you can try and aim for that so if you decide that you want to spend 20 minutes on condition games and 20 minutes on matches or whatever it is you think try and then aim for that as you're planning your sessions in the future so Damien can leave that up at the end if needs be if anyone wants to take them down but just have a real think about it how much time would you give to each particular part of that of the six headings? And then on again. So just coming to the end, I suppose what we want to know is what's what's really hitting home with G. So if you can use the little chat box again, just write in one thing that you're definitely going to take from this webinar back to your club and tell other coaches about or what really hit home with you, your number one learning from this webinar. And you can be filling that in. And then also with that is if you have any questions, make sure and get them in um, to that chat so that we can have a go at answering them. Um, there's no silly questions, so be sure to put it up. If there's something you are thinking, 100% there's someone else in the group that probably has the same question. And what we don't want is that someone's going switching this off and they still have a question. So definitely answer, ask it if you have it. Just on the question side of thing, Owen, just Mike put in there, first thing but then was questioning players. Yeah, you know, Mike, it's, it's a huge thing, really, really important. And lads up there listen to players, question players. You can't do enough of it because, again, it's, it's robbing that learning from them. And, again, it's a learning experience. You want your players to get better. Learning something from each session all the time is huge. So, again, practicing them questions and planning them questions, it's huge to your session. Huge, huge. <clears throat> Uh, thanks very much, Owen and Paddy. We'll be back to you in a couple of minutes. Just keep an eye on the questions coming in there. Again, for people that um, are haven't been with us before, I just want to show you where all the resources are kept. So longforgea.ie, into coaching, coaching webinars. And um, we get the whole schedule from May and through to April. So today's resources are just here under this link. Tomorrow morning, we'll have a full recording of tonight's session coming up there. 
You'll see our interview from Porrick Davis last week and Gary Sice uh, coming this Wednesday night. Uh, but of particular interest to all EE coaches really should be um, the resources here from week one in April and that webinar, if you want to look back at it, as well as the SNC webinar as well and the resources that went with that. So I just commented in the box earlier about the type of language that Keon O'Neill was using um, for instruction to players. It's it's not language that um, our regular 5 8 coach would be used to using. So maybe reviewing back some of those content there and using Paddy and Owen as a as a point of contact to touch in with if there's anything you need in that space, uh, the lads will be more than helpful um, working that out with you. So I just want to throw up, um, again, I mentioned about... Uh, Gary Sice coming up on um, Wednesday night and what we have coming up this night next week. So that's the Gary Sice one. A very, very impressive person. Um, obviously has four All-Ireland Club titles with Cora Finn and the strength of that Cora Finn club from top to bottom will be something we'll be delving into. And Gary is very passionate about the club and been involved in underage as well as the adult team. He's not just a, a player. He's um, He offers a lot more to the club and as a person as well, a former Galway footballer. So uh, Gary has a lot to offer as well. And um, then finally, uh, I just want to bring you up to... Um, this has always caused me a bit of grief. Uh, so the webinar for next Monday night, a uh, real exciting one. You would have heard Paddy mentioning there about uh, Michael Kenny. Uh, so coaching cheats, we're calling it. Uh, three really experienced guys here uh, will be putting this graphic out starting from tomorrow morning with a little bit more detail on these three guys. Uh, anyone in Longford would be aware of um, Kevin Stritch from his time with Dennis Connerton. Um, John Murphy has been doing webinars off late with Carlo GEA and around Leinster. And Stephen Lonergan um, is involved with Offaly GEA uh, with their county minors. So that's their Twitter and their Instagram uh, names if you want to pick them up and have a look at them um, over the next couple of days. But really excited about this one. Uh, stuff that will be covering the child, the youth and the adult coach, but how all that stuff can be related. So Kevin Stritch will be talking about the adult and the youth, but how that can even be reverted back to what a child coach could do. So we'll be linking all that together. Michael Kenny's putting in a lot of work on that. So um, I'll just bring you back to Paddy and Owen there. I will put up that last slide that Owen was talking about. And um, again, just thank Paddy and Owen for all the work they've put into this as well as Kieran and uh, Lorraine and Brandon behind the scenes. Lads are playing a real stormer. And as you see, we have lots more stuff to offer you uh, for the next few weeks. And uh, hopefully we can all get back playing a little bit of ball soon. So thanks, lads. And we just any questions that popped up there. Just something there we would have mentioned before, Damon, and to any coaches out there, there is a bit of time for planning now. And don't be afraid to pick up the phone, write out a session and send it to myself, Owen or Damien or, or Kieran. And we can give you a bit of feedback on it. That, that's the only way you're going to learn. I would have told a story last week of the first time I was coaching would have been in college. And uh, I took a coaching team or a ladies football team and the coach in the college just watched me coaching. And he came back with a load of stuff. One of them was that I kept using the word OK. And I didn't realise myself how many times I used to learn or say that. And I learned an awful lot from that. So getting someone to watch you coaching. But there's a bit of time now maybe to plan your session and say, look, lads, this is a session I'm thinking of doing with 16th. What do you think of it? Any changes you think you can make? We'll give you a bit of feedback on it and we'll get you in a better position moving down the line. So don't be afraid to pick up the phone and send us a text message or a picture of your session. That's really important. But learning from um, other coaches watching you is really important. Or don't be afraid to ask a friend to watch you and, and observe you coaching. That's the only way we're going to learn and make the sessions better. Yeah, and just to add the last thing, I don't, I don't see any questions coming through there, but... Um, Great to see your feedback and what's landing and kind of the the big one that really pops out there is questioning the players. 
And I suppose how does that link into planning sessions is try and plan the questions that you're going to ask. So rather than trying to come up with them on the spot in the middle of a pitch when you're a bit flustered, try and plan the major questions that you're going to ask. So if you're working on kick passing, try and figure out, right, what do they, does their head, hands and feet need to be? And how will I ask that to one of my players? And just have maybe a little um, card in your hand or a little piece of paper with three or four questions written down so that you kind of have them ready like ammo to ask your players on the spot. So definitely you can plan your questions and use them as much as you can. Yeah, and lots of compliments there about this um, this template that Owen designed here based on the Hurris principles. And we talked a lot about the, the six boxes there in the middle and the activities that were in it. But I suppose Owen is so used to it, he probably didn't allude to the little blue boxes around the outside. And there are questions for you as a coach that you should be asking yourself all the time. So going through all of those and prompting yourself and then really looking back at the activity that you've designed and seeing, is it matching those questions? Is it answering the, the need that you feel in your team and something that you want to address? Just there's a, a question there, Damien, from David. Um, what's the best way to deal with a player who disagrees with your advice? Um, I suppose you have to give them the evidence, Damien, so what you're doing. So was it good at what you've done or why was it good? So how good is it for the team? You have to kind of prove to them why it's good and, and and be confident in what you're doing. So say it's if he's kicking the ball wide all the time. Well, I want you keeping your head down. Well, I don't need to. He might say, I don't need to kick, keep my head down because I'm looking up where the shot is. But every maybe do it. Show him. Every time he lifts his head, he's not getting a good connection on his boot. But you have to show him the evidence and show the player the evidence. That's a big thing. And you'll know that. And you can tease that out. And then he can, he can try it out and come back to you and give him an option then. Well, are you better off with your head down or head up? So that's the way of giving them the evidence and giving them an option then of the way you, you think they should do it and the way they think they should do it. And more than likely, it's the way you want to do it that you've come, and then you can convince them because the evidence is in front of them. That's just the way I, I work with players as well, showing them and get, giving them the evidence and letting them try it out and then come back to you and tell them why. So that's that's the way of doing that. Um, Liam had a question there. Any estimate on when we'll be allowed back coaching? Liam, unfortunately, no, nothing on that at the minute. But um, you know, I suppose, as quick as we do regarding, I suppose, what the government are doing. So again, we just have to keep planning, organising stuff, and whenever when things are good to come back, Liam, we'll be ready to go flying into it, which is great. Um, would you encourage, uh, encourage using video often in training? If you can, first of all, for yourself, Liam, as a coach, it's terrible to watch yourself coaching, but it's hugely beneficial for you as a coach. Second of all, no problem, video in a training session, especially if you're trying something out and you want to show the players how well it worked showing them evidence again, which is really, really important. So what I'd say to you there is, yeah, definitely, but video yourself coaching. Get someone, give them your iPad or your phone, get them to video you, or maybe put a recorder in your pocket and you learn as a coach there. But again, video in a session is very good for giving evidence to players and letting them see it because people learn differently. People learn, some people learn by watching things, some people learn by doing things, being told things. It's very important that you, have a, you, you go through the whole spectrum there of learning. So showing them, letting them watch it, letting them do it and telling them. So all them things are very, very important. Yeah. Oh, and just, just one different, sorry. Sorry, Paddy, I'll just jump in there on that video. And, uh, just ensuring, especially most of coaches are working with youth players. So just ensuring that yeah, the club has a policy in place as regards to a recording of players and sessions and matches, uh, especially matches where you're playing against another team, you would need permission from the other team to be recording that as well. But with your own players that there's um, parental consents signed, to cover this and then also the storing and the deletion of those uh, videos or whatever. So in an ideal setting, that would be a device that would be owned by the club and it would be backed up if needs be to a, a club at GEA email address. Um, so just talking to your children's officer and then also any questions there, come to us in the office and between Peter O'Reilly and ourselves, we'll be able to answer those as well. But just bearing that in mind. And then there's a question there from Bernard about what age should the strength based exercise start at? So a real simple answer is kind of under 14 and up is, is a perfect place to start. Um, the GA15 is based for under 14s and up, so definitely a good place to start is there. But just to be mindful of the reps and sets, so that means how many times you do your RDL. So if you check our resources um, when Damien gets them ready after this, you'll be able to see it. there's a nice file and it lays out the GA15 and the reps and sets that are involved. So that's where I go and just check that sort of stuff out. 
but definitely from under 14 and up, these can be used for all players. I hope that answers your question. If, if not, let me know, give me a follow up question. Yeah, and that link is up there already under the website, so that can all be accessed straight away and the video of tonight will be there tomorrow. Brilliant stuff. When coaching large numbers, should you split them in ability and strength? Lovely question there. It depends. It basically depends. If you want to challenge player, it depends on your, your group of numbers, but it is important that you do vary it around. But if you want to really challenge the stronger players, yeah, definitely put them against stronger players. But you need to, every player needs to get a holistic approach there that they're getting challenged in different ways. But it's important that you can split them. So, Dave, or Brian, I'd say there, yes, you can you can do it strong, but what you can, you can rotate it around as well. But the idea is, again, if you go back to the terrorist principles, where my players tested and challenged? And that's the most important thing, whether it's all the weaker players together, or stronger players and weaker players mixed, depending on your numbers. But the big thing is that where they challenge and that and how do you challenge them? And there's different ways of doing that, but it does depend on your group and your numbers. But with big numbers, you can split them, but I would, you want to get some link up play as well. And again, the stronger players can help the weaker players. So if we have a guy that's soloing up and down the field all the time, breaking through, well, maybe instead of him soloing up and down the field, he can work on his maybe link play. So he, you can work on his kick passing, getting the ball into the weaker players. So that's going to help his kick passing. If his condition is he has to get the ball into certain players and it's going to help the weaker players then because they're getting good passes all the time. So again, mix it up that way. That's a good way of doing it maybe. Putting a condition on a stronger player to help the weaker players is really important. Anything else there, lads? No. Don't think there's anything on, is there? Doesn't look like it, no. No. Just finally, everyone, as well, just don't forget that the um, all the resources are on the website. So if you missed anything from any of the days, your friends, your club, your club colleagues, your other coaches are witchy, you can send the link onto them. Again, all the resources are there. So other than that, everyone, hope you enjoyed it. Hope you got something from it. And again, we're back on next Monday. The interview with Gary Sykes would be really interesting, especially the Curse Finn side of things on, on Wednesday night. Um, I'm really looking forward to myself. It'd be a very interesting one. So again, stay safe, everyone, and thanks for coming. Thanks a million, guys. Chat to you soon.